Hello and welcome to Quadriga. Can this year's UN Climate Conference take meaningful action to put the Paris Agreement into place and to save nations like this one? Fiji is being engulfed by a steadily rising sea, which makes its presidency of this year's climate conference an all the more urgent mission. It is the first small island nation to chair the conference, which is taking place now here in Germany. The goals, to build on the Paris Agreement by taking steps to limit carbon dioxide emissions and the activities that produce them, activities such as mining and burning coal. Thousands of protesters say that has to end. But at what price? Climate change, who pays to save the planet? That's the question we're posing today on Quadriga, and here are the guests who are going to answer it. Claudia Kempfert is the head of the Energy, Transportation and Environment Department of the German Institute for Economic Research. She also serves as a member of the German Advisory Council on the Environment, which consults with the federal government. And she says smart people don't waste time stuck in the past. They invest in the growth markets of the future, markets that will belong to those who spot them first. And it's a pleasure to welcome my colleague Christopher Springate. He is a political correspondent for DWTV, and he is also covering the Climate Change Conference in Bonn. And he says, pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is tantamount to sawing off the branch we're sitting on. Protecting our planet from climate change is a prerequisite for keeping jobs. And finally, it's a pleasure to have Malte Leming once again on the show. He writes opinion columns on German and international issues for the Tagesspiegel newspaper. And he says, climate protection goals must be given a stronger legal framework. We also need a precise timetable, for example, on ending the use of coal-fired power. I'd like to talk, uh, 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 first of all, about the prospects for this year's climate change conference, which has this week gotten underway in the city of Bonn here in Germany. Fiji's prime minister, which, as uh, I mentioned, is uh, the president of this year's COP, as it's called, he says his goals are to garner support for vulnerable island nations like his own and to build very concretely on the goals of the Paris Agreement, focusing for the moment on the first of those aims. Can a conference like this one truly deliver meaningful help in time, Claudia Kempfer? Yeah, I would say so, yes, because it's a working conference. I mean, we have all the Paris Agreement behind us and all the countries are still on board. The U.S. still is in because they can only step out in three years from now. So they really have to make it concrete. Who's paying in the climate, in the green bond, for example, the, the clean technology bond? Uh, who's taking which steps? And uh, this working uh, seems to be a little bit boring, but it is important because we have to keep track and uh, see where we where we end uh, in the future. Christopher Springate, um, a skeptic, might say, you know what? We have been talking about this for years and years and years, and yet the projected level of temperature rise, the projected level of sea level rise uh, remains far too high. Yes, and the skeptics say, you know, why have such huge conferences? But uh, the fact is, it's a truly global uh, challenge um, and a truly global issue. So it is something that all of the globe's nations have to agree on. Um, uh, and the, the, I think the key thing to understand is that um, fighting climate change will only work if everybody's on board. Um, and that's why this conference is actually um, far more important than it appears. Uh, if you go back to 2008, the uh, Conference of the Parties, the COP in that year, failed to do the spade work ahead of the uh, Copenhagen uh, summit in 2009, which is why that summit failed. So this... A um, uh, uh, climate summit this year is doing the spade work for next year because by next year the world is going to have to agree on rules uh, of how to report their emissions cuts in a verifiable way, in a comparable way, in a way that everybody can trust and buy into. Which means uh, essentially in Bonn it comes down to this. Can the nations taking part uh, actually deliver actions uh, to back up uh, all of the nice aims and words that have been uh, issued so far. Yes, I agree. I mean, the impression that is given by the conference is we have 197 nations participating. The talking since uh, 1992, then we have the Kyoto Agreement five years later and the Paris Agreement, and still 
emissions are going up. So, uh, so what's this, what's, what, what the hell is going on with all these conferences? But I think the conferences have a value in itself. It shows that the whole world is fighting against something that is hard to comprehend, that the way we produce energy is causing troubles like tornadoes, rising uh, 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 sea levels, and so on and so on, and really affecting the life of everybody on Earth. And I think is just right now, we're talking about this for 25 years, but 25 years to combine the whole world on this notion is, is a success per se. We want to come back a little bit later to whether the whole world is really uh, on board. <laughs> uh, but first of all, dear viewers, if you are lucky enough to live in a stable and temperate climate zone, then you may still think of global warming as a future contingency. But, in fact, it is a very distinct reality to the millions of people who are already being affected by sea level rise and by extreme weather events. Let's take a look. First, Hurricane Harvey, then Hurricane Irma plowed into the Caribbean and the U.S. Gulf Coast, killing a total of more than 200 people. Thousands lost their homes. The total damage estimate for both storms is about $200 billion. In South Asia, millions of people have been affected by severe monsoon rains. The floods this year have been the worst in decades. East Africa, on the other hand, has been hit hard by a drought, and these conditions are lasting longer than they used to. Europe has seen its share of extreme weather. Last month, Hurricane Ophelia slammed into Ireland, and Cyclone Xavier tore across northern Europe. Germany was hit particularly hard. The UN predicts that 2017 will be one of the warmest years since records began in the 19th century. This is making life difficult in many developing countries. Who will pay the price for all this? Montenegro, Germany is, as the world uh, knows, uh, struggling with that record influx of refugees from 2015. Is migration part of what you might call the price that northern countries will increasingly be paying for global warming? Migration is a price, but I think the 1.2 million refugees that, that were coming to, to Germany since the, the fall of 2015, most of them, the overwhelming majority, didn't come for climate reasons. Uh, they come from, from war-driven zones in Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, from African nations that were falling apart, Eritrea is one of the big ones. So I think right now, Climb, it, it will, and it will grow. So I think migration will grow as a problem in itself, with climate reasons as well, but right now it isn't. Can I just point out, you know, that there is um, a body of scientific opinion that uh, uh, believes that the, there was, there was um, a, a terrible drought in Syria in 2011, uh, the, the country's worst ever drought, caused... Um, uh, a, a wave of refugees within that country. And some studies indicate that uh, that is what actually contributed considerably to the outbreak of civil war in Syria. And, of course, uh, that civil war produced this um, uh, huge wave of uh, 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 migration to Europe. So... Um... I would strongly argue against that. I mean, the Arab Alien, uh, the uprising that started in Tunisia, then to, to, to Egypt, then spill over to Syria. I, I don't think the causes of all this is climate change. Uh, there, there, are there, there might be some there, there's links. There's no proof yet. Yes, but there Certainly. might be some links, but I don't see the real cause of that in, in, in climate change. And one of the reasons that we have so many African migrants is simply because, and that's one of the costs of climate change, is uh, a drought kills farms, kills jobs. So uh, they, 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 they have nothing to lose to, to trek across the, the Sahara, to, to, to risk their lives going across the Mediterranean and try and find work here. Mm -hmm. Claudia Kempfer, do you want to be a tiebreaker on this issue? Because, in fact, the <laughs> Munich Security Conference has put climate exactly. risk mm -hmm. on the agenda yeah. as a security risk, not least because of migration. No, uh, it's a huge security risk, and uh, it will be in the future. It's clear that the uh, scientific findings right now is not that uh, proven 
right now. But uh, all the IPCC, the scientific reports on, on migration and climate change, uh, is showing that migration will play a cru crucial role, and especially Europe is a factor here. So we have to take this into account and be prepared and uh, do everything we can to reduce climate change, uh, to mitigate emissions, but also help those regions who are most affected by climate change, in Africa, for example. And it's, it's really time that the Munich Security Conference and all those other areas where they discuss about security, international security, uh, takes climate change on the agenda because it's so important. The geopolitical conflicts are there and climate change is uh, increasing those conflicts and this is why it's so important. So let's talk about what can be done uh, to mitigate the risk and to support uh, those who need to adapt. And as we saw in that film, Christopher Springate, those who are already suffering worst from climate change effects are very often, if not always, those who did least to contribute to the causes. Do the Paris Agreement and institutions such as the Green Climate Fund go far enough to remedy that asymmetry? Well, it depends who you're asking. If you're asking uh, uh, Western countries, the industrialized world, uh, uh, most of the politicians representing those countries would say yes, but if you ask people from poor nations, from uh, the developing world, uh, they, um, they, that's one of the things they criticise about the Paris Agreement, um, that it did not force uh, the, the rich world to uh, make more serious financial commitments, compensatory uh, uh, commitments. That's a very contentious uh, word, one of the issues that is likely to play uh, uh, secondary, perhaps, but an important role at this year's climate summit in Bonn is the issue of loss and damage. Uh, Fiji is going to put that on the agenda. Uh, that, that moves us into um, uh, uh, courts of law, and there is, in fact, an increasing trend for people taking their own countries or other countries to law, uh, to, to court, uh, over the losses and the damages that they say they've suffered because of climate change. At the moment, the, the causal relationship between uh, uh, climate change and uh, these losses and damages is still quite difficult to prove, but um, research, there, there is so much research going on in climate science and what they call attributional science is getting better and better. Mm. That's, that's, that's yeah. very, very important because, because I think climate is not the same as weather conditions. So we cannot attribute climate change to every certain event we saw in all these pictures and tornadoes and uh, the rising sea level and all these things. Rising sea level, yes, but not tornadoes and other weather conditions. So we need scientific, if we can more, if the climatologists can prove the link and the, and the causal link between certain kind of producing emissions and weather events, that would help a lot. And I, I think the work the scientists are doing right now is very, very important for this, not least for legal battles. If you can prove it, and it started in, in the United States, it started with tobacco companies causing cancer. So if we can prove this, the same amount of, of casual links, on this level, that would help a lot. What they can, what they can show, a, yeah. Brief response to that, if you would, and then yeah, I want to... because yeah. uh, what they can show, the scientific uh, community, is that the intensity of these weather events, extreme weather events, increases. And this is already a damage reason, why the damages are much higher. But we have to see the economics behind this, because in rich nations we have high damages, like in the US with Florida and so on. But in poor nations like Africa, the damages are low. And this is why it's so difficult uh, from the economic perspective to get a right to get a right answer to this so you said in your opening statement that it's time to invest in the markets of the future but the fact is that many developing countries are going to f find themselves putting scarce capital into adaptation into simply fortifying infrastructure to resettling displaced people who can no longer live in coastal areas mm -hmm. again how can we best support them what are the best mechanisms instruments that are out there? The first thing is that we have to reduce emissions and this is the best investment we can do into emission mitigation. And we here are living in a rich country. We can invest and we should invest and we are doing investing uh, into uh, clean technologies that is electric mobility, renewable energy, energy saving, uh, infrastructure which helps those regions as well. We saw with the German policy to bring down the cost for renewable energy uh, with the investment we did here that it helps already developing countries. 
countries. China invests heavily uh, into renewable energy already, wind and solar. In African countries, this is continuing as well. So this is our job, to bring down the cost of clean, clean technology. And then those countries have a chance. Nevertheless, we are not fast enough. And this is why this conference, the global conference, is so disappointing at a certain point, because the emissions are still high. And this is why it causes uh, damages to those nations. And this is why we have to, to give money for this adaptation fund. We would be more happy uh, to, to have no adaptation, because we can remove uh, climate impacts. But that's not what, what, is, what is likely. So we have to have to have uh, investment into adaptation fund as well. But priority is emission mitigation. So let's look closer at that issue of emission uh, mitigation, which of course is the central purpose of the Paris Climate Agreement. It was designed to be a kind of a hybrid between binding plans and voluntary action. It sets out goals and plans, but they were devised by the countries themselves. And one breakthrough that made that agreement possible was agreement between the world's biggest CO2 emitters, namely the US and China. They both decided together to sign up. Now Donald Trump says that was a mistake. Here's President Trump signing an executive order aimed at dismantling key elements of the Obama administration's effort to combat climate change. Together, we will create millions of good American jobs, also so many energy jobs, and really lead to unbelievable prosperity all throughout our country. And a lot of Americans were upset that the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Can the agreement survive without the United States? So Christopher Springate, strangely enough, the U.S. has sent a delegation to Bonn. Can we be sure that its only function will be to resist? Because we've just seen the U.S. government, a number of government agencies, sign up to a report that says climate change is real, it's drastic, and it's man-made. So the U.S. government seems to be speaking out of both sides of its mouth. Well, this is one of the things that's uh, uh, fascinating uh, journalists my, like myself at uh, the, the Bonn Climate Summit. How are the Americans going to behave? Um, uh, they say they're going to represent U.S. interests. That can be anything. Interestingly, the U.S. delegation at uh, these kinds of summits um, comes from the State Department. Rex Tillerson, the uh, uh, Secretary of State, is thought to be... Um, uh, have di a different opinion about climate change compared to his boss, President Trump. Uh, the, the U.S. are still at the table. They, they are still at the table until 2020 when um, the announcement to withdraw from the Paris Agreement actually comes into effect. Uh, they are, they've even been given, uh, one of their delegates has been given a leading role in one of the key negotiating panels. Um, and... and I think the interesting thing is the US has played such a positive role m at many climate summits that um, this particular presidency, this particular summit, is trying to keep the US on, on board. Um, people are perhaps nervous about how the US is going to um, uh, behave, but they're also quietly confident. Um, I think if, if the US delegates begin to push um, Trump's coal policies, for instance, pro-coal, pro-pro-gas, all, all that kind of stuff that he's been talking about, they will get angry very quickly with the Americans. Um, their delegation is far smaller. They haven't done a pre-climate briefing. So we're, we're all waiting to see how they're going to behave. Martin Leming, this is, of course... Um a central issue also in terms of keeping other countries on board. Now, you said in your opening statement that we need clearer rules and real roadmaps going forward. But can we hope to get that while everybody's watching to see whether the major emitter is still on board or not? Donald Trump is not America. Uh, that, is, that is good news. I mean, when I arrived in the U.S. as a correspondent in December 2000, it was shortly before the Supreme Court made its verdict about Al Gore versus Bush. If Al Gore would have been president, would have been climate-fighting uh, uh, president on in top of in, in the White House. So on, I wouldn't call it grassroots level, but on the level of the states, for example, California, Cal Colorado, other states, and on big cities, you have something like a climate day, uh, conference 
on this level. It's fighting very, very hard and doing a very good job. You have on, on, on electronic level, Elon Musk with his Tesla, uh, research and development level. You have so many climate fighting technologies invented in the US, the, the, the uh, catalysator of a couple of decades ago, was invented in the USA. So, so Donald Trump is not the USA and the infectious moment from his saying no to, to Paris has not been proven right because, on, for example, the G20 summit, 19 of the G20 states were behind the Paris Agreement still. And, and the last country except the United States was Syria to sign the Paris Agreement. Which is now signing up. So, uh, yes, yes, which, which <laughs> so that really up. does leave the yes, U.S. very yes. isolated. Claudia Kempfert, it's all about jobs, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump has promised uh, U.S. coal miners a comeback for coal. So just give us the, the costs and benefits in terms of jobs. You say in your opening statement, promising green markets belong to those who spot them. But how many jobs does clean energy really create? Many of these technologies are decentral, they are small scale. Are they really going to replace things like coal jobs? Sure, they already did. <laughs> and this is a reality in the US. You said it already correctly. Because uh, the US, I mean, Trump is not USA. They have invested and they are still investing into renewable energy. Texas invests a lot into wind and solar. There's increasing jobs in this area. There's one million jobs in the solar energy alone, which is 10 times of those people working in the coal sector. So that's, that are the facts which are relevant. If Trump wants to get the coal back, he has to subsidize them heavily, which increases the electricity prices. I don't think that the Americans will like that. So uh, be careful of what he's announcing. And at the end, we see he's announcing a lot. But at the end, uh, there's not much happening. So let's see. And the emissions are going down in the U.S. because of fracking gas, which replaces coal already, and increasing renewables. So uh, the real reality is much different of that what Trump and is saying. And it helps saying. a lot that the, biggest, that the second biggest uh, uh, emissionary is China. China and yeah. China is on board. So and yeah, I let think me, this helps very much. Let me ask us to just open our focus a bit because there's one place where emissions haven't been going down and that's right here in Germany. This mm -hmm. country is very proud of its Energiewende, the transformation of its energy system away from nuclear energy toward renewables. But the fact is, it's burning coal. And the fact is, apparently, there are quite a few politicians here who subscribe to some of Donald Trump's arguments. Then how long to keep burning coal has become an issue in the country's coalition negotiations. So I guess Trump's not such an outlier after all, Malta Liming. Uh, I, I would not compare him to, to the federal uh, government and to Angela Merkel or the Greens or the FDP because all of them are on board in principle. They don't deny that there is a man-made climate change happening and that has to be fought and that certain measures have to but be then done. Why don't they get this out is of completely faster. different to what Donald Trump says. So, so I, I would say that there is no comparison that, 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 that you can make. You are right, Germany has a lot to do more than it does at the moment. And I think it was a mistake, for example, from the Greens to say, no, we don't take 2030 as the time limit. We take that out of negotiations with the, with the new government. Uh, I think this was a mistake from the Greens. We need to have certain timetables to force industry and to force all the participants to, 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 to focus on a certain time level when they have to change. Mm. Claudia Kempfert, another paradox in regard to Germany's role. It has seen some of its major car companies caught up in a scandal whereby they have fudged diesel emissions. How can this country, the host of the Climate Change Conference, ask other countries to sign up to stricter rules when its own biggest, most important corporations fudge? It's a good question. It's embarrassing for Germany, that's for sure. The one thing is that the coal sector is still very dominant. Uh, Merkel really had made a mistake in, in really uh, reducing the renewable energy sector and also blocking uh, the, the, uh, the renewable energy sector. And uh, the gas-fired uh, power plants are standing still and the coal-fired power plants are producing emissions. And the car companies are in a big scandal. And uh, immediately after that, they should have decided really to, to change. And the investment into the future is already happening. You mentioned California and China. They are investing into electric mobility so the Germans are losing those markets, and that's really bad. Christopher Springgate, just coming back. I'm sorry, we're mm -hmm. almost out of time. Yep. So give us your comment, but tied together with the following, if you would, because your opening statement said that protecting the climate is a prerequisite for keeping jobs. Certainly, that would appear to be true in the long term, but we've got a short-term problem 
here. What would you say to all those politicians who say that climate action destabilizes the entire political system by feeding populism, by feeding uh, right-wing sentiment in so far as it destabilizes old industry? I would say to them, if you don't address climate change, it's going to get worse. You're going to have more chaos, you're going to have more strife, you're going to lose more jobs, you're going to have conflict, uh, you're going to have catastrophic climate change. Um, and there is a window of opportunity at the moment. It's about 10 years. And the, the, the longer we wait, the smaller that window is. If you think of it as a graph, we can transform our um, economy from uh, fossil fuels to renewables at a nice pace at the moment. The, 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 the more you wait, the steeper that curve becomes and the more difficult it becomes. So we have to start now uh, and it will save jobs. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us here today and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. See you soon.